Welcome to the Star of Grime. So I grew up wanting to be an attorney, not really knowing what that meant other than, you know, you watch it on TV type thing. Went to law school and after my first year, so for those of you who are attorneys, you can appreciate this. So after the first year, prior to actually having a little class called Evidence, I clerked for Justice Hastings at the Court of Appeals and got a crash course. So I spent a year as his clerk. Uh, one of the first cases I got was actually a murder trial and it was a famous rap group at the time. They were appealing the conviction at the trial level and you know, armed security walking me to the law library and you know, 10 foot stack of books and you sort of learn as you go. But I knew right then, I'm like, all right, I don't want to be a trial attorney. You know, and that's at the appellate level a little different, but sort of fell in love with the, the transactional side of things and spent a lot of time um, at that point in time. You know, when I went to law school, I had been working after undergrad for Sun Microsystem doing business development and sort of discovered contracts and negotiation and you know, building things you know, with another third party and putting it down into paper. And it was intriguing to me and so focused on that, stayed at Sun Microsystems after I graduated and then ultimately jumped over to Intel. So that was the practice of law, but I knew I didn't want to be an attorney long term. Uh, so I had an opportunity with one of my client groups who was starting a software group to go over and so we formed the software solutions group and they're, I guess, one of the tails that wag the dog there at Intel. They're probably, I think, 3,000 employees now and they do about 300 million in revenue, uh, which is small if you're Intel, but at the time, we, considering we started from nothing, it was pretty impressive, so that's the background. Okay. How long have you been in the role as co-founder and managing director of a copy venture? Yeah, almost 10 years. Wow. So I had, we were toiling away on the, the Valley treadmill up in Silicon Valley, and my wife and I, and she was an exec at Sun, got to a point where we could truly live anywhere, and sort of took a look around, you know, principally the U.S., and said, you know, let's find some place we want to live. Picked Orange County, moved to Orange County, but at, at that point I was probably spending 20 nights a month out of the country. I mean, it would be here a week, Russia a week, here a week, China a week, here a week, Brazil a week. I did that for about three years before I just decided I couldn't take any more. Um, but through that process, I got to know two guys here, Matt Massengill, who was running Western Digital, and another guy, Dwight Decker, was CEO of Connexent Systems. And they were forming a group called Octane, which is sort of a networking group as well. They were talking to me about joining Octane, getting Intel involved, and I wasn't really interested in that, and Intel wasn't interested in those types of initiatives. And part of that was, hey, we should do a fund. And so I gave them advice on some things. They came back and said, you know, would you launch a fund? Field of Dreams style, if you remember that movie from the 90s, Field of Dreams. And so I was literally told, if you build it, we will invest. And so they introduced me to a handful of people as prospective partners, and the thinking was to do seed early stage technology and healthcare investing here in Orange County. And so I met you know, Sharon Stevenson, my partner. Uh, we hit it off, you know, had a lot of common um, philosophies in life and, and what we wanted to do. And so we set out to raise 20 million, and this was in July of 2005. Um, we ended up at 27 million in May of 2006, and you know, too ignorant to know any better. I'd never raised money before, so my first entrepreneurial attempt at raising money was skip the company and raise a fund. Um, yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't advise that in retrospect, <laughs> but I'm here, so. But yeah, so we went live in May of 2006, and we now have a fund, we're investing out of fund two, so we've got about 50 million between the two funds, and again, seed early stage tech and healthcare. And can you take us through a typical day? Like, what, what is your I'm day I'm still like? waiting for a typical day. I don't, there's a, <laughs> there's a few like constants in my day, but it tends to be less work-related. Okay. It's, you know, I, I tend to get up at four, and then swim, surf, work out, do something from typically four to five-ish. Check email while breakfast to coffee. Kids get up, get them ready, get them to school. And then so I'm in the office typically at 7.30. And then 7.30 to whatever time I can't take anymore is, tends to be meetings. So you're meeting with entrepreneurs, you're meeting with co-investors, um, executives from various companies that you're, you want your companies to partner with or maybe even acquire at some point. So I may do you know, a half dozen to a dozen meetings each day and then you know, normal lunch, that kind of stuff too. But, and then evenings spent with the family. So that's pretty much it. So you find a balance. Try to. I mean, I don't, you know, when someone's asked me the other day, I'm, you know, well, how many hours are you working? 
I honestly can't say that I've worked a day since I left Intel. It, what you do is just what you like to, how you like to spend your time. And so I think of it in terms of time allocation. And you know, my epiphany that of what is possible is actually back in the late 90s, we were an investor in research in motion. So I had one of the very first two-way Blackberries and I was a young attorney and I was actually closing a transaction on a ski lift in Tahoe. So I'd type out what language I wanted to see in there and then on, you know, hit the run down on the way down there, pick up the phone and call and then, okay, here's what we're gonna do. I closed and I said, okay, I no longer need to be in an office. I can now do this, what I need to do pretty much anywhere. And that was sort of the first sort of glimpse on what's possible. And so now between you know, the various I devices, I mean, I'm in my office, you know, one day a week typically, unless we need to meet, with, you know, for something that doesn't require a Starbucks or somewhere else. Right. So. Can you share a particular experience and a key lesson you learned through your experience that helps you lead your company today? Well, I think in terms of venture, I mean, the hard, one of the hardest things for me, and I'm a pretty laid back guy, as you can tell, is, is learning to say no. I mean, the request on time, I'll give you an example. So the first week we went live, I had probably had 17 to 20 calls and 200 emails that very first day of the, of sort of launching. It hasn't stopped since. I tend to get, you know, 500 emails a day and, you know, a dozen phone calls a day. You can't filter everything. You can't say no. And for me, I said, you know, even if I'm going to say no, I want to get back to these people in a timely manner because I've been on the other side having raised money on, you don't get the no, you don't get the yes, you get the, I'll think about it, or maybe, or you know, no response. You've got to sort of move on. And so I think the advice would be is, you know, take no politely, but persevere and, and try to figure out whether, you know, why there's a no if you can, and then move on though, because too many times you spend a lot of time chasing a yes from someone that's never going to be a yes. And that's true in business. I mean, it's just and true in life. It's you know, focus on where you can move forward and, and make some progress. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Right. <laughs> what things do you think that are that? What do things do you think are important to today's VCs? Like, what are they looking for? I know that everyone's a little bit different, but there's got to be some kind of. In terms of, of what they're going to invest in. Um, that or like, or do they look for teams, or are they looking for yeah. like anything particular? Yeah, I think it depends on the VC. It depends on the firm. I mean, so there's a lot of variables. This is, you know, I honestly, when I went into this, it was a small part of what I did at Intel, but I had what they called strategic investment managers that were in part of Intel Capital, which was their corporate VC arm, that were on my payroll, and it's like, all right, here's what we're looking for. You bring it to me, and I'll say yes, yes, no, whatever it is. But it wasn't what I was focused on. And, you know, what I had mistakenly assumed, and I should have known better, but you sort of think of a sort of nice linear line on, okay, here's what you're looking for, and it's, it's a science. And I was quickly, I had two advisors I talked to before leaving Intel that were sort of patriarchs of the venture industry that I knew just through my dealings. Talked to both of them, and they said it is the, the rarest of art forms at the early stage. It, don't put too much science into it because it's not science, it's art. And I didn't understand that. I was thinking it's this nice long line, but it's the squiggly, because the variables are the, the individual VC, the fund, how much money the fund has, what stage the fund invests in, and whether there's geographical parameters, where they are in the fund's life cycle. These funds tend to be 10 years, five year investment period. The typical liquidity from first money is about nine and a half years. So if you're in year one of a new fund, you've got time. If you're in year five and you're making the last of your investments, they're not gonna make an early stage bet. It doesn't make any sense. It just it doesn't work. And so all of these come into play. But I, I mean, the cliches are cliches for a reason. You need a strong team for so many different reasons and you need to have a set of skills and personality and the ability to collaborate not only with each other, but with your board, with your customers, with your prospective partners in the community or the business community. You need to be able to hire and fire and train. And I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. And, so what we look for is someone that shows that background. And for me, I, mean, it, I think the one that's sort of most telling is someone that understands an industry far better than I ever could based on my research and during my diligence. They're from that industry. They understand the problem they're solving intuitively. They're the right person to go and solve it. They have built a team around them that hey, I'm gonna go follow this person. They know what they're doing. They've shown sort of leadership in that capacity. And they've got a solution that you know, is compelling and competitive, 
and ideally sustainable. I mean, a lot of what you see now is, you know, I, I look at something down here and I ask them, well, have you done any market research? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're the only ones doing this. And so I'll, off the top of my head, give them 12 examples that have been funded from five to 50 million with, you know, one to five year head start. It, it happens a lot more in Southern California than up north. And I think that's a good thing, by the way, because I don't think we're caught on the, the Silicon Valley, you know, treadmill or sitting in this echo chamber, but it can be a challenge in that regard. So, I mean, it's big market, you know, right team, right solution for the problem, but that's what everybody's claiming. You know, beyond that, it, it's sort of, there's a lot of sort of gut that goes to it. You have these sort of dialogues with the entrepreneurs and you get to know them and they get to know you and, you know, you do your diligence on them. And then I always tell them, make sure you do diligence on me because if there's something about me that's not gonna be a good fit that I'm not aware of, tell me and we'll, we'll stop now. Because you're in the, you're in the, with the exception of Chris, who I think we were in a total of eight months, usually they don't happen that fast. Usually it's, you know, eight years, not eight months. And so you're working with them for a long period of time. It's like a marriage. It, and once you're in, you're in. So right. it's one of those things. Very good. So is there anything, like, are investors, is there something that they're looking for that they don't tell us? Well, I don't know about that they don't tell you. I mean, most of the people, they're all, we're all looking for the same thing, a way to make an, you know, a multiple on our investment in a reasonable amount of time. That's actually what it comes down to. And I don't think there's enough attention given to that in the media. I mean, you can go today, what you're able to find out online today, whether it's through Google searches, through blogs, through Twitter, through Mattermark, or any of these other sort of publications, is night and day than it was when I started. And again, I haven't even been 10 years. That's how fast things have changed. It's, there's so much transparency and information if you want to go get it. And I, I think you know, everybody's sort of looking for the same thing. I think the one thing that the press doesn't really pick up on, and, and a lot of VCs don't talk about, they want something that ideally is, you know, they're going to make that multiple, but they can help. We actually want to help. And there's a fine line from being helpful and being, you know, problematic. You don't want to be in the, the CEO sh proverbial shorts because at the end of the day, you know, if we take a board seat, our fiduciary duties are as a director. We're not a member of the management team. And I've seen too many trouble, you know, problems when VCs pretend to be management. And if you have to be, because for a different reason, that's different. But generally let them do what they do. They're there to give them advice. We're there to make introductions. And that's principally it. But I, you know, I wish the press talked about the fact that, listen, I've got you know, n number of years to turn my million into 10 million. And to be able to do that, I have to own a certain percentage of the company. And the company has to sell for a certain amount. It's, it's pretty simple math. And those opportunities are very uh, few and far in between. So what are some better ways for startups to connect with potential investors? Um, we don't always have like, you know, a direct connection sometimes. Yeah. Is there any um, suggestions that you can give some entrepreneurs? Like, how do they get in front of someone like you um, <laughs> without being annoying? Well, I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't mind people being annoying because I'm annoying. So I get that. I've got two kids as well. So I know that works I, <laughs> constantly. Um, yeah, I think if it's... It, so personally, I mean, she talked about my, my hibernation. I mean, I haven't been to a conference in probably several years. I haven't done a speaking engagement or keynote in probably five. And only because I have enough sort of potential investments coming through entrepreneurs that I've worked with before, or may have invested in before, other VCs that are larger or later stage or up north, and they're seeing something down here and they want to partner because they're not local. I have enough of those to deal with. In fact, that's my biggest challenge as a small fund and we're entrepreneurial ourselves. There's two of us in our offices about this size and we turn our desks and talk. And it's, it's a bandwidth issue. I think, you know, for me, the conferences that I would attend or, or have attended have been more topical. They're not the general meet and greet networking events. It's, there's an area of interest, artificial intelligence. I'll go to the, the sort of geekiest engineering oriented conference I can find on artificial intelligence and just immerse myself in it. And I'll get to know people through those conferences over a period of years talking about a subject matter that we're both interested in. There's, there's a lot of, uh, it's much more genuine that way than, hey, I'm looking for money, you know, here's my elevator pitch and okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it and I have my email and phone number on there, but 
I'm appreciating thou shall come by way of referral. I didn't really understand that. It's like, oh, we're going to be different, you know. Our door, we have an open door, and literally I've had people come in, sit down, and start pitching, and I'm on a call looking up going, wait, what? Um, I had a couple other people I had to escort out, but that was a, a different story. Uh, yeah, so I don't think there's any sort of tips on that. I think if you, chances are in today's age, whether it's through LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, blogs, community, service providers, you probably know someone that knows someone that's a VC. Um, it's a little more challenging down here. There's not a lot of us in Southern California. 95% um, of the venture capital dollars under management are actually up in the Bay Area. You know, not necessarily a surprise, but there's you know, only a handful of professionals managing those dollars, so most of them are up there. And what has been one of your most successful decisions? And besides marrying my wife? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, oh, I like that. Yay. Having, having kids, <laughs> that was up there. I think learning to let go early. Hmm. You know, part of the you know, five-year hiatus, too. So I've been much more internally focused the last five years. I had, had between family and friends, several people, you know, battle cancer, some won, some lost. Um, you sort of appreciate living in the moment a little more, but you have to sort of keep one eye on what's going to happen. I see a lot of people get caught up in the minutia when at the end of the day that's not what's going to drive value in your life or at your work. And the people that sort of get it the quickest tend to do well in my experience. And you just sort of watch and learn through the process. But so I think decision, I mean, launching this fund was a big one. My, I've never heard, you know, my father's career military and officer you know, this big 6'5", 275 pound guy, and I had never heard him curse my entire life, if you can believe that, until I told him I was you know, giving up the corner office to go try to launch a venture fund, which he didn't know what it was. And it was, you know, are you effing crazy? And so the, the back story is I gave notice on paternity leave with my first child. And so one of the reasons I agreed to do this was, you know, a couple months prior to making that decision, we were at a friend's wedding, you know, in Cabo, and I'm looking at my wife who's pregnant, and I'm going, I don't want to be gone the next five years, that's for sure. Because I was gone like 20 nights a month. I mean, we were coordinating rendezvous, and we got to, you know, meet up at Paris and D.C. and these cool places, but it's not what I wanted to do, you know, in terms of being a first-time father. So that was probably the biggest, more recent one. If you had a chance to start over, what is one thing that you may have done differently? Um, probably taken one of my degrees in psychology. <laughs> A lot of what I spend my time doing is via email and phone, talking to people and helping them think through situations or problems. And a lot of time, the things that they're thinking through are people-related. How do I handle this employee? How do I handle this boss? How do I handle this board member? How do I handle this partner? And the situations all change, but there's a lot of commonality. And I think the more you can understand people, the better you'll be in that regard. I, I think that, you know, that's probably the one thing, at least in terms of being a VC. A lot of our time is spent coaching, counseling, and my partner, she's, you know, DVM, PhD, the whole nine yards as well. And we jokingly say we've got a little black couch. I mean, we've got two little black chairs. We're not a couch, but a lot of our time is sitting there talking to CEOs or their team or their other board members on, you know, don't do this, do this, um, which I would have never have anticipated, but... Do you have a personal mission statement? Something that you live by? Or life short. Life short. It is. I like it. <laughs> and so is my mission statement. Yeah. <laughs> life short. Um, how can we support um, our, a support and attract entrepreneurs to Orange County? Uh, it's tough, you know. We, it's funny because I was talking, so I went around, you know, hat in hand, and I have to do that every few years. And it's getting easier because of success, but, you know, I can remember talking to some of these people, and I'm convinced some of our first investors did this out of their philanthropy bucket rather than their, I'm looking for an ROI bucket, because it was, they looked around, they watched the success and the boom bust of Silicon Valley and went, we could do that here. We got a strong research university, we got other universities. We've got tech companies, we've got healthcare companies. We could do that here. If there's more VC, the entrepreneurs will come. 
And it made sense. I got it. I'm like, oh, absolutely. There's more money. Entrepreneurs will show up. And then I figured out a little secret. It's the other way around. The money follows the entrepreneurs. And so the, the, there's actually a good book by a friend of mine, Brad Feld. It's called Startup Communities on how you sort of jumpstart startup communities. And it, it's real, very well rewritten and to the point where you know, I would encourage you to read that if you're interested in getting a startup community going. I think buildings like Eureka and what Peter's doing and what you're doing with Startup Grind, that all helps. But it has to be the entrepreneurs doing the work. It can't be you know, the financier. It can't be the attorney or the accountant or you know, Irvine Company. Nothing wrong with the Irvine Company, by the way. But I'm just saying there's a lot of people that have objectives on, hey, we want to grow demographics for this for tenants or for residents or whatever it is, that's great, but it has to come organically from the entrepreneurs. And I've seen that, you know, Chris and some of us have gotten together at a place in Newport, and I won't tell you where, because we don't want it too it's crowded, secret. but it's a secret place on PCH right over the bridge. And, but we'll get together <laughs> for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Early in the alphabet. Um, but we get together for coffee once in a while, and it's, we've got a unique identity down here, which I clearly have bought into hook, line, and sinker, but I mean, I've actually done board meetings on surfboards or paddle boards. And you have to do some of the perfunctory stuff after or before to make that work, but embrace the community, embrace the unique identity, because I'm watching what LA's doing in Santa Monica and Venice, and I spent a lot of time up there. You've got entrepreneurs moving from Palo Alto, Menlo Park, San Francisco, down to enjoy that lifestyle. We have it here, unfortunately, and I just had lunch with Peter, I guess it was last week, it's not as concentrated, right? They're crammed into Santa Monica, Venice, along the beach, and there's a bunch of them. We're spread out all over, right? We've got pockets in Newport, we've got Irvine, we've got San Clemente, we've got San Juan Capistrano, we've got Santa Ana, Huntington Beach, and I've seen one or more company in probably every one of the 34 cities and most of the unincorporated Orange County in the last 10 years. And they're really spread out, and they're in a little office park, and there's no commonality or continuity in conversation. When you go up there, you leave, everybody at the bar or the restaurant you know, are entrepreneurs, and they share war stories and tips and intros and tricks, and they're all truly wanting to help each other. And proximity helps. And I think you know, if you can get some density going in some of these places, that will only help. And I think the other thing is patience. I mean, we, we were told, you know, we're going to go do this. I laughed. And I said, you know, it's going to take several decades to, to be what you're envisioning. I don't care how much money you throw at it. It's a people problem and a bandwidth problem. And it's true. I mean, we're 10 years in. We've got a lot more startups. And, you know, there's a number of venture firms in Southern California now. And, you know, when we did this, you know, the concept of a seed stage fund as a fund didn't exist. There were the angels. Soft Tech VC was started at the same time. And now you've got a ton of these micro VCs, 500 startups as an example. Um, Homebrew, Sousa Ventures, there's probably 20 or so I can think of just off the top of my head, all you know, 10 to 30 million and they're doing the earliest stages and they roll up their sleeves. They're all ex-entrepreneurs or operators. They, they know what the issues are, they know how to help and you know, that's a good thing. And then we'll end up with more of them down here I suspect too. So. What should OC leaders in our community do to help bring or support the tech you know, the tech, the entrepreneurs, the investors, like yeah. how can they support, us, support uh, our community? Read startup communities, for one. Um, the problem is I think people have the right intentions and it gets derailed. And so if you're talking about people that are at, at sort of the municipality level, whether it's the city or the county, the administrator, um, political types, they have different objectives that may or may not align with what entrepreneurs truly need. And I said, the sooner they can figure out what that is and find a way to to align interests, the better. I mean, entrepreneurs, you know, they need support. They need, you know, cheap rent. They need uh, access to capital, access to talent, people they're going to work with, access to customers. I mean, all the things that you need to start a business. And it's here. It's just sort of spread out. And, and depending on what type of business you're, you know, you're starting. If you're a sports action parallel company, you can't, couldn't think of a better place to start it. There's, it's a very supportive community. Tech's a little more challenging. Um, you know, spinning companies, I spun, my, my first investment was a company I spun out of UC Irvine. And it was an interesting experience working with them, um, partly because they're a public university, I think, and partly because they're reasonably new at it compared to, say, a Stanford or, or a Berkeley up north. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, 
align objectives or incentives because that's the, the toughest part. My last question that I have for you tonight is what's next for Mark? Next for me? I'm going to go home and <laughs> read, the, read the stories to my kids uh -huh. and you know, do it all over again tomorrow. Yeah, I know we're, we're probably about, in, for those of you, you know, some point pitching me, so we're about 70% committed on the second fund. So we're only two years in and we've already done, made 12 investments, already sold a company, uh, a couple more in the hopper for one to go public next year, more than likely. So we're moving extremely fast. Um, I'll probably raise another fund next year. It, we'll see. I, I like what I'm doing. I can't imagine doing anything else. And it's starting to have an impact, which I like. But beyond that, I don't know. You know check the surf report in the morning and figure out whether I'm going. That's, I try to live one day at a time for the most part. Love it. Well, thank you so much. No, we absolutely. appreciate you coming and sharing um, some information with sure. us. And let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you.